This video is going to walk you through the early steps in how we see from the light information out in the world, it going through the eyes and up to the visual cortex. So that's where we're stopping. And think of this as a sort of knowledge foundation video as some future videos are going to refer back to this one. And this is admittedly a different approach than what I've done previously with things like the retina being bundled into cat vision. Cool? Cool. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! I'll mention at the outset here that what we're going to talk about in this video would be things that you would see in an upper level psychology course, specifically perception. But the prereqs for what we're going to talk about would be things like how neurons work or how we figure stuff out in psychology in general. So for the purposes of this video, I think we can let you audit this lecture. For completeness, I'm not going to be going into some of the physiological details like where certain parts are getting their blood supply from unless it's directly relevant. In this video, we're going to follow the flow of information as it moves through the visual processing system up to the cortex. For instance, the light coming off whatever you're watching this video on starts the journey with. There are many parts to the human eye, so we're just going to focus on the ones that directly deal with getting the information in in a usable way. Light coming in first passes through the cornea. This is the thin, transparent, outermost part of your eye. But it isn't just there for protection of the eye's inner swishy parts. It actually accounts for 80% of the eye's focusing power. If we look at an actual eye from the side, you can see the bulge in the front. It's a natural optical lens that's focusing light from the outside world. However, in humans, it's a fixed structure. It can't move or change shape. As such, its focusing power is constrained. The remaining 20% of the eye's focusing power comes from the lens, the other part of the eyeball's optical lens parts. With regard to the light coming into the eye, the lens sits behind the cornea. Technically, it's behind the iris, too. Unlike the cornea, the lens can change shape. This is what lets it fill in the other 20% of focusing power. While we're here, I'll also point out the little stripey bits connected to the lens. Those are the suspensory ligaments that hold the lens in place. There's also some muscles around there, but more on those in a sec. Time for a helpful illustration for how the cornea and the lens work together to get light focused onto the back of the eye. And an important detail here is that for stuff to be clear, the light needs to be focused at the point where the light sensitive cells are in the back of the eye. This is your eye, devoid of focusing bits. Whatever you're trying to look at will practically always be out of focus, blurry, because the light coming into the eye won't be refracted or bent much. This is kind of similar to trying to use a camera without its lens. You've got the light sensitive part, but no real ability to focus the light. We add in the cornea, and things are more in focus. If you only have the cornea, like you just had cataract surgery and had your lens removed and haven't been fitted with an artificial one yet, you would be farsighted. This means that things far away are in focus, but stuff closer to you are blurry. And this is due to the cornea's shape and placement. Adding in the lens brings things into clear focus through a process called accommodation. The shape of the lens can be changed by the ciliary muscles. When the ciliary muscles are relaxed, the lens is in its resting shape, held in place by the suspensory ligaments. At this point, the lens is about as flat as it will be. As such, it won't be doing a bunch of refracting, so the stuff in focus will be relatively far. When the ciliary muscles tighten, the lens gets lovingly squished into a more round shape. In this different shape, the lens is doing more refracting, so things closer to you will be in focus. The eye we've been playing around with here has been that of an emetrope. This basically means someone who wouldn't need any corrective lenses to see clearly. So an eye doctor terms 20-20 vision. And so when we're doing the number number vision, that means you versus an emetrope. And so 2020, you're an emetrope. 2010, that means that you can see at 20 feet, but an emetrope can see clearly at 10 feet. 2100, you at 20 feet can see clearly what an emetrope can see clearly at 100 feet, so definitely needing some correction there. 
A person who's nearsighted is called myopic. And if you need a mnemonic for this in the future, think near vision, near me, is near my person, myopic. This can result from the eyeball itself being larger than normal, or from the optics being more powerful than normal, or both. This results in things being imaged in front of the retina. And so the person is nearsighted because close things are in focus, but they have a harder time getting the stuff further out to focus. Corrective lenses will reduce the focusing power of the eye. This would show up as a negative diopter in the prescription. Someone who is farsighted is hyperopic. This results from the eyeball being too short, the optics not strong enough, or both. Whereas in amatropia, the image is correctly focused at the back of the eye, and myopia, the image is in front of the retina, in hyperopia, the image would be focused behind the retina, but it kind of gets blocked by the retina itself. Experientially, in this case, the person has a hard time getting the close stuff to focus, but further away is fine. Their corrective lenses add focusing power, so it have a positive diopter. However, as we age, the lens gets harder and the muscles get weaker, so it becomes more difficult for us to accommodate close vision. And this is known as presbyopia, basically means old eyes. And you may have seen this in older people you know, or possibly yourself if you're over 45. This is something that's noticeable to others, usually when the affected person is trying to read something, like a menu in a restaurant or a phone. And so, if you're watching it go down, it usually plays out with the person trying to read it at a reasonable, comfortable distance, but it's not in focus. And nope, that's not making it better, so okay, yep, yeah, this is improving it, but still not in focus, depending on how far their presbyopia is. and. You know, it, they can end up doing some gymnastics trying to get whatever it is in focus. Of course, this can be fixed with glasses, but not everybody wants to wear glasses because it's a hard pill to swallow that you're getting old and your body's falling apart. Then there's also astigmatism. This happens when some of the optics in the eye are more football shaped than basketball or softball shaped. And yes, the official descriptions use sports ball analogies and I married into a Steelers family. For a person without astigmatism, with the round optics, the light is being focused equally from all of the sides, so you end up with a nice clear image. But for the person with astigmatism, the light's being focused as it should be in the middle part of the football shape, so it's being focused to that point. But when you move off to the corners, you start losing that clear focus. And the orientation of the footballness can vary between people and even between eyes on one person. So corrective lenses for astigmatism will have the degree or the angle of rotation for the football shape. Right, so light gets focused on the back of the eye. At that point, it'll probabilistically be absorbed in the retina by photoreceptors. I say probabilistically because it's not guaranteed. We touched on this in the cat and dog vision video where all of the light coming in doesn't get absorbed by the photoreceptors and what happens as a consequence of that. So part of the probability of light being absorbed hinges on the wavelength of that light. For the full discussion of the absorption stuff, check out my video on color vision. But the important part here is that we have two categories of photoreceptors, rods and cones. We typically have three types of cones with different absorption curves that are a function of differences in their pigment. Cones support color vision. Rods are best at absorbing light in the bluish-greenish range, even though they don't really factor into color vision much. The cones are in their highest concentration for our central vision, meaning where you're focusing on and looking, and they kind of trail off from there, and rods are out in the periphery. All right, here's some quirks of our eyeballs. The part of the photoreceptor that absorbs light isn't pointed towards the light source. It's actually pointed towards the back of the eye. That means that light coming in has to pass through all of the photoreceptor and wiring before it can get to the part that does the actual absorbing. Also note that for a lot of your retina's real estate, part of the stuff in the way are blood vessels. So if you look at a nice bright image, like I've provided for you here, assuming it's taking up enough of your field of view, some stuff will start to become visible. Some of this will be little bits of matter that are floating around inside your eyeball, called floaters. Normally, these settle out to the bottom of your eye, but if you shake your head vigorously for a little bit, you can get them to float up again. And 
These are normal. There's nothing to freak out about, but if you do have one that becomes very obstructive in your vision, it's possible to have lasers blow them up. The cool thing is sometimes there'll be a blob that passes through vision. Odds are that was a white blood cell passing through. For the other quirk, allow me to draw your attention to the blind spot. This picture is what you would see inside somebody's eye with ophthalmological tools. The fovea is the area of central vision in the retina. This is where the eyeball's optics are trying to focus light to. There's a slight but noticeable darkness to that area in this image. That's because this area and the surrounding bit called the macula is jam packed full of cones and other pigment. And so there's less light bouncing back to the camera in this spot. Off to the side is the blind spot. And there is substantially more light bouncing back from this area to the camera than the rest of the image. Why is that? Let's go back to the diagram. This is an anatomical feature from how our eyes are wired and supplied. There is one entry and exit point for getting stuff into or out of our eyes. And as such, there's no photoreceptors in this area. And this is why that part of the photograph was brighter. Light wasn't really being absorbed there compared to the rest of the eye. But Cass, I don't have two huge gaping holes in my vision. What's up with that? I'm glad you asked. There's two factors that play into our relative obliviousness of our blind spots. First, they're out in the periphery. And as you move out from central vision, stuff gets blurrier and it makes it easier for the next factor to be missed. The second factor is that the brain cheats and fills in that blind spot with the surrounding information. Demo time. And this is somewhat sensitive to size and distance. So if you're watching this on a larger TV, it might not work, but you can just scribble down a little copy and do it that way. For this, close your right eye and look at the plus sign with your left eye. I'm going to move them around a bit, but if you're doing this by hand, you'll need to move the paper towards or away from your face. As this is moving around, keep your right eye closed and your left eye focused on the plus sign. At some point, if the sizes are working out correctly, the dot will appear to vanish. This happens because the dot has slipped into the blind spot for that eye. Prior to that, the brain is filling in the blind spot with the surrounding information, but you don't notice it because it's all plain white. But when the dot moves into that area, the brain's still trying to fill it in and pretend like everything's fine. There's not a hole there, it's fine. So it keeps using the plain white as it had been. Only now, there's something for you to notice missing. As labeled in the diagram, the blind spot is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. So let's talk about what feeds into the optic nerve. I've hinted at this in the previous perception videos, but this is finally the one where we're going to talk about neural convergence at the eyeball level. So in the cat and dog vision video, I mentioned that cones support the high level vision of humans. And part of this is due to how different types of photoreceptors are wired in different parts of the retina. Before I put the next image on the screen, just remember a couple things. For one, it's going to be a lot. There's a lot of information there, and this is one of the trickier parts in SMP. We're not going to go into the super specifics of what connects to what and why. There's just one main connection path I want to show you, and this is the only way to do it. But you're not going to be tested on this. If you remember the main point of what I'm trying to show you, you're good. Okay. Light is coming in from the top of the image, so sort of looking up. The bright red parts are the blood vessels, the darker blue and pinkish squid looking things toward the bottom are the photoreceptors, and everything else in between are the details we're going to gist if I. One way information gets out of the eye and moving towards the brain is through the photoreceptors, which pass their info along to the bipolar cells in green, which then pass their info to the retinal ganglion cells, pale yellow, at which point it heads off for the optic nerve. The horizontal, brighter yellow, and amacrine cells, light blue, move information horizontally instead of directly out. And the point of that is a topic for another day, so we're not going to worry about these ones today. There's about 126 million photoreceptors in one eye. There's about 1.2 million ganglion cells for that eye. That means that the photoreceptor signal is being compressed down very early in this processing stream. This compression isn't uniform. In your central vision, which you remember is exclusively cones, there is one cone to one retinal ganglion cell, so one to one. This means that there is no compression happening right where you're looking. 
as you move out from your central focus of vision, convergence increases. On average, six cones will be sending their information to one retinal ganglion cell, whereas the average convergence rate for rods is 120 to 1. This is part of why there's a difference in acuity and sensitivity between the rods and the cones. The low convergence rate of the cones buys you high detail image quality, but at the cost of being less sensitive and low light levels. Okay, so we've got the information coming out of the eye through the optic nerve. Most of the information will travel through the optic chiasm. If you happen to know Greek, you'll be able to spot where it is on this picture. Chiasm means cross, and it's a point where some of the fibers in the optic nerves from each eye cross to the other side. I remember being taught in elementary school about the crossover between which side of your brain is controlling which side of your body. So the left side of your body is controlled by your right hemisphere, and the right side of your body is controlled by the left hemisphere. And when we're talking about vision, this is sort of true, but it's, it depends on the framing. The framing in this case is we're not talking about eyeballs strictly going back and crossing over. We're talking about the visual field. So information from my left visual field is processed in my right hemisphere, and information from my right visual field is processed in my left hemisphere. And if this didn't really make sense, don't worry, we're going to break it down. And this is one of those things that you're expected to be able to do at the grad level. So be patient with yourself. Back to the diagrams. The yellow lines represent the parts of the optic nerve that will end up processed in the right hemisphere, and the red is headed for the left hemisphere. Really quick, look at where the yellow and red are sitting in the eyeballs. Keep that in mind. You may have noticed in the eye diagram that the image on the retina is flipped from how it is outside the eye. This is a consequence of using optics to focus light. But the image isn't just flipped on its head. If you were to do this transformation in Photoshop, you would need to flip the image vertically and horizontally. The physicist I fact-checked this with said it would be incorrect to call it a 180 degree rotation, even though that's kind of what it looks like, especially in Photoshop, but fair enough. This means that stuff out in your left visual field is imaged onto the right side of your retinas for both eyes, and same holds true for the other side right visual field is projected onto the left side of both retinas. So at the optic chiasm, the part of the optic nerve carrying information about the left visual field goes to the right hemisphere, and the nerve fibers that have info about the right visual field go to the left hemisphere. The fibers that stay on the same side are called ipsilateral fibers, and the fibers that cross over are called contralateral fibers. As this figure roughly shows, in humans about half the fibers cross over, but this can vary between species. An interesting consequence of this is that it can help give a hint for where some sort of brain damage has occurred, either from something like a stroke or an aneurysm or sustained in an accident. If a person's vision is impacted for one half of their visual field, you know that the damage is after the optic chiasm. But if the damage is only for a quarter of their visual field, you know it's gotta be somewhere between the eyeball and the chiasm. Granted, in either of these cases, the person's hopefully well on their way to getting an MRI done to see where the damage actually is, but it can help give a rough idea of where to look. After the optic chiasm, the majority of the fibers continue on to the part of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN for short. A minority of fibers instead go to nearby areas, including the superior colliculus. It's also worth mentioning that there's a fair amount of interconnections between these different areas. Briefly, the superior colliculus is an older structure that's involved in some types of eye movements, specifically orienting reflexes. Like if you hear a suspicious noise off to your side, you tend to look at it without really thinking about it. The LGN is a complicated little area with many layers, cell types, and some processing of its own. We're going to skip that for now and focus on its function. First, the thalamus generally acts as a relay station between sensory information coming in and cortical processing. The LGN, being part of the thalamus, does act as an intermediary between the retinal ganglion cell projections and the visual cortex. But the LGN also receives input from the reticular activating system in the brainstem, and the system is crucial in maintaining arousal and consciousness. Damage to this area can result in a permanent comatose state. The reticular formation activity could be acting like a volume knob on the intensity of sensory information coming in. For example, it's been demonstrated that when an animal is drowsy, 
there's lower overall activity in their LGN. Second, one type of cell in the LGN gets a lot of input from the superior colliculus, and it's been argued that this helps shut down vision in between eye movements. And so at this point, it would probably be useful to make a distinction between different types of eye movements that we can make. They're smooth or continuous, where you're just tracking something as it moves around in space, and the eye movements that you're making are smooth and not jerky. Then there are saccades, or saccades, depending on your pronunciation. And this is where you're going from point to point. So this is a non-continuous, discrete eye movement. And so the thing that is being argued for here is that you go from point A to point B, even if you don't close your eyes, you're not seeing the world whiz by you as you go from point A to point B. It's sort of like vision just sort of pauses for a second as you go between those two points. And this is a possible mechanism for how that happens. Finally, the LGN gets a lot of input from where it's going to send the information, the visual cortex. And so this is a feedback loop between the two areas. Although the exact reason or nature behind this feedback loop isn't clear yet. Concluding the flow of visual info for this video, the information from the LGN continues back to the visual cortex for even beefier processing and further distribution in the brain, but that's a tale for another day. Alrighty, we have followed the visual processing flow from the light being absorbed, that information getting ganged in the retinal ganglion cells, passed upstream where it's divided by field of view, making a stop in the LGN before continuing up to the cortex. And that's it for this video. It's been a little bit since I've done the YouTube call to arms, so like for more edutainment, comment with any questions or observations you have, and subscribe, please. Subscribe, 10K, yes. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, my Discord server, or on Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description box. And yeah, see you guys next time. Bye.